Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You may think that you cannot do without the things that you want right now, but I can tell you if what you want is what God wants, you'll end up with it. But you don't have to spend all your time trying to get it. If you chase God, the blessings will chase you. Spiritual maturity. I'm going to start with a story that anytime I use this story, I pretty much always close with it. But I thought, I'm going to do it backwards tonight. I'm going to start with it. Sometimes I just like to shake things up a little bit. Amen? A couple went into an antique shop, and they saw a very beautiful, I mean, a really beautiful, magnificent little teacup sitting very high up on a shelf in the store. And they just fell in love with it. They thought, that is the most beautiful teacup I had ever seen. We have to have this teacup. While they were admiring the teacup, all of a sudden the teacup began to talk. <laughs> And it said, you know, I have not always been like this. There was a time when nobody would have wanted me. There was a time when I was not attractive at all. You see, there was a time in my life when I was just an old, hard, gray lump of clay. And the master potter came along, and he picked me up one day, and he began to pat me and reshape me, and I said, stop that. What are you doing? <laughs> that hurts. Leave me alone. And he simply looked at me with a little smile and said, not yet. <laughs> And then he put me on this wheel and he began to spin me around and around and around and around. And I got so dizzy I couldn't even hardly see where I was going. I felt like I was losing it. Everything was spinning around. I didn't know what was going on anymore. I felt sick to my stomach. And I said, let me out of here. And he just smiled and said, not yet. <laughs> Anybody kind of get the symptoms? Okay. Finally, the day come when I had taken on another shape. All that spinning around finally gave me another shape. And all that padding and molding and squeezing and pinching gave me another shape. And all of a sudden, he put me into a furnace. And it was called the first firing. And it was so hot in there. Oh, I could not believe how hot it was. I thought, I can't stand this. I'm going to die. You have got to get me out of here. <laughs> Don't you love me? Well, crying, why are you leaving me here? You see, the oven door had glass in it, and the master could look in through the glass, and he just had this big grin on his face and a certain look in his eyes, but he wouldn't let me out. And then he just smiled and simply said, not yet. <laughs> Finally, the oven door opened, and he took me out. He set me on a shelf, and I thought, Phew, thank God that's over. Then he began to paint me all over. We think that, oh, thank God that's over. I finally got that one. Then he began to paint me all over with this stinky paint, changing my color from gray to a pretty blue that I am now. And I said, this stuff stinks. It's choking me. <laughs> I don't like this smell. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. And all he would say is, not yet. Then he put me back into the second oven, and it was called the second firing, and it was twice as hot. And I thought, now I'm really going to die for sure. This is the end of me. This will finish me off. Get me out of here. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I bet this sounds like some of you maybe even this week. <laughs> I'm telling you, God, I can't stand it. I mean, really, God, I really can't stand it. Get me out of here. And he would just look through the glass and say, not yet. I don't give up on me. We're just about done here. Then one day the door finally opened, and he took me out, and he put me up here on this shelf to let me cool off. <laughs> How you like that when God puts you on a shelf to let you cool off? <laughs> and after I cooled off, one day he came by and he handed me this mirror and I looked at myself and I could not believe how beautiful I was and I could not believe how much I had changed. Well, I did not look anything like that old gray lump of clay that I started out to be. Now I'm this beautiful little delicate teacup and everybody wants me now. But there was a time in my life when nobody wanted me, nobody liked me, nobody paid any attention to me. They just kicked me around and walked on me. But now I'm special. But you see, I wasn't always this way. Give God a praise here.
Now, I've always had a, a leaning toward teaching in some way, shape, or form on spiritual maturity. When God called me to teach, I was a person who'd been a Christian for a long time, but I had never really been taught really hardly anything at all about spiritual maturity. I was taught a lot about doctrine. I had good doctrine. I knew about the Trinity, the blood of Christ, communion, and a lot of the things that we learn when we go to church. But I wasn't hearing what I needed to deal with the kinds of problems that I had in my life. And so because of that, I certainly wasn't a very good witness. I really wasn't helping anybody else. And so when I really began to learn the word and I saw what God really wanted to do in our lives, I just had a passion for the Christian who loves God but just keeps staying in that baby stage of Christianity. And when we're like that, not only can we not really help anybody else, but we're not happy. We're not happy, we're not content, we're not satisfied. We always think there's one more thing that we've gotta have to be happy. And Jesus died that we could have and enjoy our life, not so we could just now be a miserable Christian. You know, it's one thing to be a miserable sinner. It's another thing to be a miserable Christian. I think that there should be some kind of a transition that takes place. And you know, God wants us to enjoy our lives. There's no doubt about that. And he wants us to be blessed. But I want everybody to be clear and understand that that's not the only reason why you're on the planet. God doesn't have us here just so we can get everything we want and just so we can be happy and we can have a nice life. We are his representatives in the earth. The Bible says it clearly, that we are God's representatives, and the Amplified Bible says that God is making his appeal to the world through us. Now, every single one of you in this building, and everybody watching by TV, I want you to know that you are important to the cause of Christ in the world today. And if there was ever a time in the world, ever a time, and I know that times have been bad in the past. We always say, well, this is the worst things have ever been. And, you know, then sometimes you read some stuff in history and you think, well, I don't know, maybe not. But, you know, things are really bad and more and more people don't believe in God. More and more people are finding reasons to try to get God out of their life. And so really and truly, we do live in desperate times. But they can also be wonderful times if we'll all just realize I'm not here just for me. I'm here because God wants to do something, yes, for me, but he also wants to do something through me. And in order for him to do something through me, I have to get out of his way. Amen? So, just real quickly, if... If maybe you've never made that transition from saying, God, I need this, I need this, do this for me, give me this, give me that, give me something else. If you've never made the transition from that to God, what can I do for you? What do you wanna use me for? Then how about let's just do a turnaround here tonight and get things straightened out the way that God wants them to be. I love the story of the prodigal son and you're probably familiar with it if you've been in church very much. But just real quickly, when that boy left home, he wanted his inheritance, and he left saying to his father, give me. Give me. After a trip in the pig pen, and realizing what he had given up, and what he had at home, he said, I'm gonna go back to my father. And when he went back, he said to his father, make me what you want me to be. So we need to go from give me to make me. We need to go from this is what I want to God, what do you want? And I can tell you, you may think that you cannot do without the things that you want right now, but I can tell you if what you want is what God wants, you'll end up with it. But you don't have to spend all your time trying to get it. If you chase God, the blessings will chase you.
We all have many, th I mean, I have things that I want. I have things in my life I don't want. I have things that I don't have that I do want. You know, we all have desires. We all have things that we want. But we have to get things right. Jesus said, I'd rather not do this. If you can remove this cup from me, then remove it from me. And nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. So, spiritual maturity. What does spiritual maturity look like? A person who's spiritually mature, what are some of the things that we might see in their lives? Well, first of all, there's a lot of self-control. There's a lot of, God, I want your will in their prayers. They're very careful with their words. They have very disciplined speech. They don't live by their feelings. They have feelings, but they don't let their feelings rule them and control them. Lots and lots of consistency. Not one time, one way you see them, and another time, the next time you see them, and happy when their circumstances are good, and not happy when their circumstances aren't good, just consistency. Lots of generosity. A real spiritually mature Christian, you don't have to try to talk them into giving. They get up every day looking for ways to be a blessing to people. <laughs> Lots of humility from a spiritually mature Christian. Quick to forgive. Difficult to offend. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure that all of you here have all these qualities <laughs> and that you don't really need much of this, but I've been in kind of a season lately of God dealing with me about some things. And I told somebody tonight, it's been a while since I've gone through this. I've been walking with God quite a while. And, you know, God deals with us in layers. Sometimes you think that you just really mastered something. And then all of a sudden, God will come along. And, you know, when you might say, well, what do you mean God's dealing with me? Well, one of the things when God is dealing with you is you begin to notice things in your behavior that maybe you didn't pay that much attention to before. So I've been hearing a lot of in my heart, well, that was selfish. Well, you sure didn't need to say that. And it's been kind of going on for a little while, so I'll just tell you the truth. If you don't need this message tonight, I'll be happy to stand here and preach to myself because I do need it. And you see, you're gonna be growing your whole life. This is not just something where you arrive. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said, I've not arrived. But one thing I do, it's my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and pressing on to the things that are ahead. He said, I am, now listen to this, he said, I am determined to take hold of those things for which Christ Jesus died to take hold of me. So he said, Jesus died for us for a purpose, not just so we could go to heaven, but so we could develop Christ-likeness and be molded into his image while we're here and the world could, he, he said that he showed the world the Father. Well, now he's given us the job of showing Jesus to the world. That's what we're supposed to do. And it's not just up to somebody like me that's on television or has a large audience. Every single one of you can reach people that somebody like me could never reach. Every single one of you. You know people in your neighborhoods. You know people uh, in, at your workplace. You meet people all over the place. And if, if every Christian would just turn the lights on. I don't even know what I mean by that. Just turn the lights on. My goodness, you know what, to tell you the truth, if Christians will stop compromising and stop slipping over into the world and really take a stand to be what God wants them to be, we can see some great things happen in the earth. And so I've always preached along these lines in different ways. I don't preach on the same thing all the time, obviously, but... 
I preach along these lines because I know that if we stay baby Christians, we're not ever going to be happy. And I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be here, I want to be happy. I mean, if we're going to stay baby Christians, we're never really going to have any peace. You know why? You can't control all your circumstances, and neither can I. So we have to learn, if we can't control our circumstances, that we need to learn how to control ourselves so our circumstances are not ruling us all the time. Amen? So. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And all of us, as with unveiled face... Keep that unveiled face in mind. I'm going to explain that to you. Because we continued, stressing continued, to behold in the Word of God as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are constantly being <laughs> transfigured into His very own image in ever-increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So, God changes us in degrees from glory to glory. And so I told you, God's been dealing with me about just, just stuff, you know. I don't know. Not probably anything that's going to send me to hell, but just stuff, you know, just things that he wants me to come up higher in. And uh, so what he's doing is he's calling me into another level of glory. You go from glory to glory, to glory, to glory. Well, usually, well, not usually, always you will have to be dealt with about something, something that you have to leave behind in order to go to that next place that God has with you. So I'm hoping this weekend that we can help you with the Word of God, move some obstacles out of your path, and just go ahead and make a decision to stop putting some things off and just get on with it and begin to do what God wants you to do. I mean, because really, how many times do you want to go around the same stupid mountain? I mean, most of you are like me. You've been around the same one long enough that you're dizzy. It's time to just go through it, go over it, or, you know, whatever. So, he says that as we look into the Word, it becomes like a mirror, and what we see when we look in the Word is we see Jesus, but we also see ourselves. Has that ever happened to you? You, you think, well, I got a long way to go in that. And, <laughs> well, I got, uh, uh. Or, you know, it's just, or just reminders, just reminders. You know, I, every time that I read the Word, I don't learn something new, but I get reminded of things that I need. Now, it's, I want to tell you something up front, and this is very important. Very important that you hear this. You, we never will change if we don't learn how to receive conviction and correction from God without letting it condemn us. When I first started really hearing the Word preached in a way or it was convicting me of things that were wrong in my life, every time I went to church and went home, I felt worse when I left than I did before I went. Because I always left thinking, well, another thing that's wrong with me. And I didn't understand that was good news. I didn't understand that God was loving me by showing me things that needed to change in my life. So I never changed. Because as long, now listen, as long as you get condemned or feel guilty every time somebody preaching says something that convicts you or, you or God deals with you when you're praying or you read something in the Bible that convicts you, if your first response is to feel guilty and condemned to feel bad about yourself, then you're just wasting your time. You will not grow. The devil just loves it that you now feel worse than you did. How many of you understand that? All right. Now, aren't you tempted sometimes whenever you get convicted by God to just start going... I'm so bad. So I can tell you that I've come a long way in this because, I mean, I, I had such a problem with guilt because of being abused by my dad that, I mean, I didn't feel right when I didn't feel wrong. I mean, that was all I knew how to do was feel wrong. And so I have, thank God, been set free from that. It was a long journey. And it is, it is wonderful 
And even though I told you that God has been dealing with me about some different things, I can also tell you that not one time have I felt bad about myself. Not one time have I felt guilty or condemned. Now, I, I feel sorrow. We should feel sorrow over our sins and our misconduct. We, we want to be everything that God wants us to be. But I've also learned that really and truly, when God chastises us or he shows us an area in our life that needs to change, it is an act of his love. He's doing it out of love. You better thank God that he loves you enough not to leave you alone in the messes that you're in. And so how about this? Before you ever pray again, God changed this, that, something else. How about starting with God change me? God change me. Because you see, if we change, our circumstances won't bother us nearly as much as they do right now. And we can't expect God to change everybody else in the world so we can be happy. <laughs> oh God, make them all be like I want them to be so I don't have any problems. We, no, God, God uses people that irritate the living daylights out of you to change you. And he doesn't... <laughs> And you can, you can run away from the ones you got now and you'll just move next door to some more or go to work with some more. I mean, you're just not gonna get away from them because we all have rough edges and God finds plenty of sandpaper out in the world. <laughs> Amen? Woo, hallelujah. So what does this mean, all of us as with unveiled face? What, is, what, 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 what's with that? All right, 2 Corinthians 3, we're gonna go back to verse 13. Nor do we act like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze upon the finish of the vanishing splendor which had been upon it. In fact, their minds were grown hard and callous. They had become dull and had lost the power of understanding. Now, now listen to this. For until this present day, when the Old Testament, the Old Covenant is being read, which is the law, a veil lies on our hearts and is not lifted to reveal that in Christ it has been made void and done away with. Now here's part of our big problem. As New Testament Christians, we can't keep acting like we need to live under the law. Legalism will keep you from growing. God does not give you a boatload of rules and regulations to follow. He gives you the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of you, to guide you and to prompt you in what is right for you. So here's the thing. In the Old Testament, all kinds of laws, all kinds of dietary laws, animal sacrifice laws, holiday laws, feast laws. Now when we say we're free from the law, we're not free from the moral standard that God laid down even in the Old Covenant. The moral standard is good for all time. But we are free from rules and regulations. And let me tell you something, there's plenty of churches you can go to that still will load you down with rules and regulations, and there's plenty of well-meaning people that will load you down with rules and regulations. You can even have a group of friends that are all involved in a certain Bible study or a certain prayer group, and boy, if you don't feel like you're supposed to do that, they can certainly make you feel guilty because you're not doing their thing. Amen? or whatever it might be. You know, actually, I mean, I was so legalistic, I didn't really need anybody to help me. I could just do it all by myself. I mean, I, I made a law out of cleaning my house. Everything was a law. Everything had to be done every day, and if I didn't do it every day, then I, I felt guilty about it. And so he, what he's saying here is as long as you read this like it's a law, like now, boy, this is something I have to do, and if I don't do it, God's gonna be mad at me. See, here's the thing. Even if I stay selfish, God still loves me. Uh, yeah, I knew, I, I knew you'd go. <laughs> okay, look, let me tell you something. God will never love you any more than he does at this moment right now. Yeah. See, that's what legalism is. Legalism thinks that by better behavior, we can earn more of God's love. 
But you don't earn anything from God by better behavior. We don't try to behave better to get God to love us. We want to behave better because he does love us. We want to behave better because of what he has done for us. So when we look in here and we see Christ, and we see that in him the law is fulfilled, and that he's given us the Holy Spirit, and that everything that God asks us to do, he also gives us the power to do it. He gives us the grace to do it. Well, we need to learn how to receive correction and conviction from God without letting it condemn us. That's the only way we'll be able to grow and spiritually mature. Wereldwijd vast. It's a hostile territory, prison. And I'm speaking proof of that. Zij die achter zulke muren leven zijn mensen, en Jezus vraagt ons om naar hen om te kijken. I'm here for third degree burglary. I have a lengthy sentence of 400 months. The judge looked at me and said, "I'm going to sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life plus 20 years behind these prison walls." A lot of people don't have family here. So they feel forgotten. There's not a lot of people beating the door down to get in here to see us. Here you go. God bless you. That outreach of the hand to touch their lives in a personal way, to, to come visit them, to, to see that somebody is really thinking about them, that somebody cares for them on the outside. You're giving to people that really are like at the bottom of the totem pole. And with your giving, that, uh, that's actually bringing somebody up. It's the fact that you thought about us, even if it was just to come by and have prayer. We just feel loved, you know? That we're not pieces of garbage, you know, um, thrown away. Um, that somebody does value us still. And that there is hope, there's hope for us. Tot nu toe hebben we meer dan 3600 gevangenissen bezocht zijn er meer dan 3 miljoen cadeautasjes uitgedeeld. En meer dan 139.000 gevangenen hebben voor hun leven met Jezus gekozen. You know, the Word of God teaches us that if we are willing to share what we have, God can multiply that and make it into a lot more than what we started with. So please share. Help ons om andere mensen te kunnen helpen. Bel ons 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meijer.nl slash partner. Elk gebed en elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. It's very painful and difficult to go through life with a wounded soul. I know because for years I lived that way due to being sexually abused by my father when I was a young child. But I learned that God could heal even my deepest hurts if I would just open my heart up and let him in. And in my new book called Healing the Soul of a Woman, you too can discover how to allow God into those wounded places in your life. God has a brand new beginning for you and you do not have to spend the rest of your life hurting. Bestel nu Innerlijke Genezing van de Vrouw via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Faith always opens a door for God to work. Every time that you pray for someone else and you really pray in faith, it opens a door for God to try to do something in their life. Meer uitdagende gedachten vind je op het Joyce Meyer YouTube kanaal. Het bekijken waard.